Welcome to cooking class. I am Scott Richardson. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I am a chef and co-owner here at Bullfinches with my mother, Peggy. A uh, quick little history about myself and uh, the restaurant. My parents started their first uh, restaurant when I was about two years old in a little town called Latham, New York, just outside of Albany, New York. Over the course of years, they opened four, uh, three other restaurants in the Albany area. In addition to being in the restaurant business, my father was also in the ski business, uh, which is what brought us to Massachusetts. Uh, he was one of the co-founders of the ski market here in Boston uh, a long time ago in the mid-70s. Uh, so that's what brought us here to Sudbury in the mid-70s. In 1981, this space became available and my parents decided to open Bullfinches. Uh, it was named after a beautiful antique piece of etched glass which read number eight bullfinch place which was designed to hang in one of our entryway doors but sadly it was broken during construction so at that point in time there were menus printed and signs hanging and, and uh, 75,000 matchbooks that read <laughs> bullfinches on them so uh, that's what we continued on as uh, I started here at the age of 13 uh, my father was the executive chef at all his restaurants. Uh, so when he was at home, I got to cook up by his side in the kitchen at home. But it wasn't until they opened Bullfinches that I got to kind of work in a real restaurant kitchen with him. Started here as a dishwasher, uh, graduated to busing tables, waiting tables, tending bar, uh, you name a job in the restaurant business, and I have done it. Uh, in addition to those responsibilities, during my late teen years, I was an apprentice chef, uh, also known as kitchen slave, kitchen, <laughs> kitchen wench, whatever you want to call them. Basically, anything the real chefs don't want to do ends up on the apprentice chef's table. Monotonous, drudgerous, mind-numbing tasks. Rule number one when it comes to cooking, practice. And that's what that was as an apprentice chef. Peeling potatoes, slicing onions, shucking oyster after oyster. Um, it's all practice for your culinary career going forward. And that's what I tell guests here too. Rule number one when it comes to cooking is practice. Keep practicing. Um, so at the age of 20, my father left the business. About two weeks later, our head chef gave his notice. Uh, I volunteered to step in on an interim basis, which has now lasted close to 30 years. Um, so I took over the kitchen at the age of 20. I have no formal culinary training. Everything I've learned, I've learned by doing, which is really uh, points to practice. You know, the more you do things, the better you get at them. Uh, I tell guests oftentimes I'll make things look easy up at the demonstration table. There's a reason they look relatively easy, because I've done these things hundreds, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of times over 30 years in the kitchen. Um, two rules at cooking school. Uh, one, when everybody has food in front of them, please begin eating. We try and time our courses to come out of the kitchen in conjunction with me ending a demonstration. Uh, that doesn't always happen, so when you've got hot food in front of you, please begin eating. Uh, rule number two, uh, conversations during demonstrations, keep them to a dull roar so that any guests who want to hear what I have to say can hear what I have to say. Uh, don't hesitate to ask questions tonight. Uh, probably the most fun I know I personally have at cooking class, and I think guests who have been here before uh, probably feel the same way. Uh, raise your hand at any point in time and ask a question. Uh, don't feel you need to keep your questions to the topic at hand. Uh, if you have general cooking questions, questions about appliances, cutlery, cookware, uh, whatever you want to talk about, the restaurant business in general. Uh, I have been doing it for close to 30 years, so if you've ever wondered how or why we do things, Mike, you can pour the first wine if you want to. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, Michael Bushy from Commonwealth Wines. Good evening. Michael has brought the wine and his expertise. Uh, I know Michael feels the same way about questions. Uh, 
No pretense of cooking class. There's no such thing as a stupid question. It's uh, only the one left unasked. All right, so we're gonna make uh, we're gonna make lobster bisque, and lobster bisque is uh, basically kind of the the rule I learned uh, long ago in the restaurant business, especially in the kitchen. Anything that goes into the trash that you've paid for is costing you money. You might as well just take money out of your pocket and start putting it in to the trash barrel. So. A very savvy chef long ago, after breaking down 10 lobsters and finding a pile of meat this big and a pile of shells this big, said to himself, that I, I pay the same amount per pound for this as I did for that. So what can we do with it? Perfect example, lobster bisque. I talked about practice, first of all. This is uh, points to rule number two, patience. <laughs> to make good lobster bisque, you have to be patient. You have to take your time and make a beautiful lobster stock. And that's where it all starts. That's the, the base of your recipe. And it takes time. I mean, uh, not tremendous amounts of time. I think I'm, uh, my stock simmered this morning for about, probably about five hours. Probably about five hours. I'm not gonna bore you with a bunch of details, but I did wanna show you the type of simmer that I'm looking for in a stock. You'll notice I don't have a heavy boil going on, really just kind of very light bubbles and this slight evaporation of water. We wanna do it patiently low and slow because we want to extract that flavor gently and and extract every bit of it and uh, what I find boil it too hard you evaporate too much water before the before the essence of the lobster had gotten into it so low and slow uh, lobster stock smells great the day you make it not so much the day after you make it now I'm very fortunate I have a nice exhaust system. So if you don't have a, a really good exhaust system at home, uh, what I recommend is uh, a lot of the gas grills nowadays have a little burner on the side. Set it outside, put a uh, loose cover on it, uh, and you can do it out there. So the rest of our stock, Mirepoix, everybody's heard of it. Am I assuming correctly? Mirepoix, carrot, celery, onion. All right. And I bring the ugliest pieces of celery to demonstrate that these are probably the pieces of celery that you want to use in your stock. All right. Just a coarse chop on our celery, leaves and all. We could even throw this stem in if it was nice and clean. Fresh carrot. When we're dealing with carrots, the last thing we want to do is peel them. About 90% of a carrot's nutrients and natural sugars are in the peel. So what I do is just wash them really well and use them whole. Uh, if you've ever often, we do uh, roasted carrots here often and I do them often at home. If you've ever tried to roast a carrot, after you've peeled it, you're not going to get that beautiful caramelization because there's no sugar. It's all been peeled away. So wash them really well. Now in the case of this stock, we're going to do a lot of straining. So I'm not too concerned. I'd be fine to throw the butt of the carrot in there. That's fine. Uh, and in the case of the onions, I'm happy to leave the skins on. Oftentimes, uh, in the case of our braised short ribs here at the restaurant, we use a mirepoix, but we will peel our onions because we will reserve that braising liquid and then puree it to make a sauce. So it's got that carrot, celery, and onion in there, sans the peel, because the peel is not very um, tasty. <laughs> so our stock, 
carrot, celery, onion, mirepoix, and then we'll move on to our lobster. If you don't have a, pair, a little box of latex gloves in your kitchen at home, I recommend them for things like this, uh, cutting onions, peeling garlic, handling chicken. Uh, if, you ever, if you've ever breaded items, you know, you end up with big, you know, big uh, fry daddies on the end of your, on the end of your fingers. Uh, so very easy to peel these off. In addition to these, when I'm working with lobsters, and I'm not saying you have to do this if you're just breaking down one lobster, but I will break down, you know, 25, 30 lobsters at a time. And if you've ever taken a lobster apart, you know they can be spiny. Uh, this makes it much easier to handle. And I just keep a separate pair uh, that I use for this, um, run them through the dishwasher when I'm done with them, and then air dry them. So one thing I want to do, since we talk about flavor, the first thing I want to do is grab all the flavor. So we've got our cooked lobster, and you've, you know when you break open a lobster, a bunch of goo falls out. That goo's flavor, all right? Mother Nature's giving us flavor. We want to get as much of this as we can and save as much of it as we can. So I'll always, I'll always break it apart over a bowl. So this is what we'll start our stock with, all right? And then once we break down the rest of our shells, we'll start adding them to our stock. Flip our tail on its side. Now I normally have a uh, a rough and tumble knife, a knife that I'm not so concerned about the edge on. Uh, I'll use this for dirty leaks, uh, oftentimes because they have a lot of sand and dirt in them. I also use it for breaking the backs of lobsters too, uh, because I really the my other knife, which I use all the time, I really like to maintain that edge, so I don't want to do anything to damage that. So this we're going to go right down the middle. Take it apart. We're going to save all, save this coral right here. Perfect addition to our stock. And then I like to set them in, uh, because we're going to take these and chop them up and use them for garnish. I like to get them uh, cleaned up. I'll try and get, as, as I said, as much stuff as I can in there. And then we'll just put them in a little bit of cool water and clean them up before we chop them. Break it at the first knuckle. Now what I'm gonna do, I cover it with a damp towel to keep from splashing myself with lobster juice. What I'm gonna do is use the back of this knife and I'm going to do my best to hit it right at that intersection of the bottom claw right there. All right. And it's just a quick little sharp crack. How do we do? Perfect. Well, I shouldn't speak too soon. Has anybody here ever tried to uh, rush a recipe? Yes. Yes. And your results were less than stellar, I would uh, venture to guess. It's one thing I've learned, a hard one lesson, patience. So we've got our stock. And what I'll normally do is I'll reserve, um, I'll, I'll strain everything, but I'll normally grab a couple of lobster bodies uh, out of my out of my strained liquid. I'll have my little strainer there with uh, little bits and pieces of carrot, celery, and onion. And then what we do is we'll, we'll build our roux uh, right on top of these lobster, this lobster body. Now, in the, back in the kitchen, in our case, uh, Chef Robert will normally finish the bisque. 
Uh, and he'll normally start with probably half a dozen lobster bodies. And then we're just going to slowly build our roux. Roux is melted butter and flour uh, blended together. And that's going to give us uh, our, this is basically our thickening agent. Uh, you'll notice our bisque is not very thick. We really don't like to make it too thick. We just like to kind of give it a little bit of body. In addition to our stock, we're going to add some tomato paste, which is going to give it that nice deep red color, or in this case, a pinkish hue once we've uh, added our cream. So a little bit of tomato paste. And then the secret weapon. <laughs> sherry. You had it, right? Anybody who's worked with sherry when they cook know that it's the secret weapon. So once we've got our ingredients all incorporated here, we're going to uh, let this simmer very much, uh, very much like our, our broth, like our stock. We're gonna let it, uh, I like to let it simmer for about a half an hour or so, and then I like to bring up the temperature a little bit to start cooking that roux and thickening it up. And uh, I will cook that for probably another uh, 15 minutes or so. Um, let it reduce down. I think in here it says reduce by about a quarter if you can. Um, at that point in time, we'll take it out, we'll give it one final straining, get that last body out of there. If there are any clumps of roux or anything in there, we'll be done with those. Then we'll put it back on the, put it back on the burner and add our heavy cream. All right, so it's two, straining, two strainings. And then our last addition is heavy cream. Bring it to uh, one more boil after the addition of heavy cream, and she should be done. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Rule number three, hold all your applause wow, until, you've, so until you've eaten everything, all right? Yeah. Let's not put the cart before the horse. Uh, so we're gonna make Dijon crusted rack of lamb, all right? So our marinade, oil, fresh rosemary, garlic, lemon, fresh mint, a little bit of salt and pepper. We like to, I say six to eight hours, we like to put, you know, 12 to 24 hours on it if we can. It just um, adds more flavor to it. Uh, generally when we do a marinade for a lamb, I always make the addition of some type of citrus, uh, most notably lemon. Lemon tends to break down the tissue a little bit to, uh, soften up or tenderize our lamb all right so when we go to portion our lamb normally uh, your first uh, your first move would be to lay it on the table and start cutting right okay not in this case not with something that has bones running through it what I like to do is flip it over because there's certain little spaces between these bones that allow you to get your knife into. So I could say, okay, perfect, that's a perfect half right there, but I start cutting down, I'm gonna run square into that bone. So flip it over. Generally, if you're portioning even numbers, uh, what you wanna do is take what you have in front of you and start by cutting it in half. Don't try and eyeball your first cut here and then your second cut's a little off, and then by the time you get down here, you've got this little sliver. So I always say, start in the middle and work your way out to portion. Now in this case, we like to take our lamb rack, and we like to get four nice portions out of our lamb rack. Uh, the reason we like to do that is for even cooking temperature. So if we took this whole lamb and put it on the grill or roasted it, obviously our ends are gonna be more well done than our center. So we like to cut it into portions that are gonna cook evenly. Now in this case, so this is about half. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find my little opening right here between those two bones, start working my way down. And then as I work my way down past that bone, it looks like I have to go in this direction a little bit to make it a, a nice half portion. So we've got two nice portions. A look for that sliver. Now I'm not concerned about number of bone. I'm concerned about 
size of portion. So we'll find my little opening right in there. And same over here. Notice I'm not concerned about bone, how many bones I have. I'm going to find my nearest little opening. And you'll notice I'll go in, start my cut past the bone there. So I've got, well, that one's OK. That one's a little. But relatively even. Now what we're going to do, a little bit of salt and pepper. You notice I still have a little bit of marinade. I haven't rinsed them or patted them dry. I'm fine with a little bit of marinade on them. It's actually going to give me a little bit of oil when I go to sear them. So we want to season through the cooking process a um, little bit at a time. The reason we do that, we want to build nice uh, depth of flavor. We don't want to kind that, that just sprinkling of salt and pepper over the top of a dish. We want to kind of taste it in the whole, throughout the whole dish. When it comes to cooking on the stovetop, your sense of hearing is probably the most important sense because really what it is, what we're, what we're striving for is the right sound when things are sizzling. So the best way to uh, tell pan temperature, dip your finger in some water, dry pan, obviously, splash it into our pan. And I don't even look at the pan. I'm listening to the pan. And in this case, I'm listening for the sound that I want my lamb to make, which is, I would say, a medium high sizzle. All right? So I'm just going to put a touch of canola oil in here. Uh, we use canola oil almost exclusively in the kitchen here. We use it for two reasons. I'll interrupt for a moment. Whenever we're going into a saute pan, we always want to work away from ourselves. So we start near, set it away so in case I'm dropping that in and something splashes as opposed to dropping it and it's splashing towards me, it's going to drop and it's going to splash away from me in your direction. Right towards James. Uh, there was a reason we put you there. <laughs> so you'll notice I kind of, I try and grab a little bit of oil as I go into the pan. Back to um, oil, canola oil, almost exclusively for two reasons. Uh, one, very high burn temperature. You get it really hot in the pan before it starts to brown and burn. Two, and probably the more important, is... Uh, Neutrality of flavor. It doesn't taste like anything. Uh, I know a lot of uh, people cook with olive oil, um, but if you've have ever had really good extra virgin olive oil, it is very olivey. It can be smoky, somewhat pungent. I use an example of a scallop. So you want to sear this beautiful fresh sea scallop. You sear it in olive oil, your scallop now tastes like a big olive. You, scot you sear it in canola oil, it tastes like what it's supposed to. So you'll notice I haven't done anything to these lamb chops since I put them in. Patience. And this is where your sense of hearing is really important. If you've listened to this at all, you've heard that nice, even, consistent sizzle. And that's what we're driving for. Uh, if you've got proper pan temperature and the right sound, there's not a whole lot of stuff you need to do. Really what you need to do is focus on the sound that it's making and adjust temperature as needed. Okay, do you see that? Yeah. That's patience and proper pan temperature is what that is. One thing I will mention, if you'll notice these nice little brown bits in the bottom of the pan, the last thing we want to do, this is what is called the fond, F-O-N-D. And the last thing we want to do is put this pan into the dishwasher. That's Mother Nature giving us flavor. That's caramelized lamb. And we want to get that into our dish, come hell or high water, whatever we have to do. So in this case, uh, if you've ever got the wine that you're going to be serving with dinner, that's the wine that you should cook with. Uh, always use good wine. When we cook with wine, we concentrate their flavors. 
If we cook, start with bad wine, we make it really, really bad. This speaks to my heart both as a chef and as an ex-dishwasher. All right? <laughs> Little, oh, this got a little. That's got a little alcohol to it, doesn't it, Michael? <laughs> See, now look at that. Now this. Now you can put this in the kitchen sink when you're done with it. All right. <laughs> you folks are very easy to please. <laughs> All right. So how how are we going to get that how are we going to get that flavor into our into our dish? So we've got this nice reduced red wine. We've got a little bit of the we've got a little bit of the lamb fat. So I'm going to whip that right into my Dijon mustard. Okay? Little rosemary. Salt and pepper. Give it a little swirl. And then what I like to do is just take my lamb rack, dip it right in the bowl with my Dijon mustard. Give it a good schmear. I like to get everything. Dijon and the deglaze from the pan, a little bit of red wine. Drop it into your bowl. Now, these are kind of smaller bowls than I would normally use. When you're doing something like this, give yourself some space. You know, give yourself some room. Give yourself big bowls. Give yourself lots of space to do things. So, because what I like to do is I like to set it in there, like to take some of the crumbs, sprinkle them over the top, give it a good pressing right into the crumbs, make sure I've got good coating all the way across. And then we set this onto a uh, sheet pan and we like to do it on a rack so if you've got a rack that you can put it on uh, they make cooking racks uh, I wouldn't use your um, cookie cooling trays uh, buy some specific racks and the reason we like to put this on a roasting pan on the rack is so that heat can attack it evenly from all sides when things are cooking they are under attack from heat all the molecules in this lamb chop are bouncing around looking for some place to go. All the flavor molecules, all the, all the water molecules are all looking for some place to go. So when you've got a hot steak on the grill and you cut into it to see if it's done, you create a beautiful escape route for all of the moisture and all of the juices. All right, so how do we tell Scott? This is how we tell with an instant read thermometer. And the reason we use this is because the probe is very small. It goes in. As it comes out, it's so small that it seals back around it. Things are traditionally served with what they graze on. Lamb, traditionally grazed on mint. That's why it's served with mint. You'll also find juniper sauces paired with venison because venison used to, nowadays obviously our lamb does not uh, graze on mint, but, th but there is a particular reason and tradition behind it. Everybody enjoy their lamb? Yes. Yeah. Did you enjoy your wine? Yes. 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 Good, 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 good. So we're gonna make uh, pears poached in port. Okay, very simple, very, very easy. <laughs> terrible idea. <laughs> My apologies. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start our little, uh, our poaching liquid. So we're gonna start with port, orange juice, and then I'll normally test it to see kind of where I'm at with liquid level. Now normally, uh, the more pairs you're doing obviously the less liquid you need because they're going to raise it. So I'll take it up with a little bit of water. Into our poaching liquid, uh, cinnamon stick, star anise, and a little bit of nutmeg. All right. 
In addition to that, yeah, I'm sorry, I was, do, go by my recipe, not by, do as I write, not as I do. So I use, uh, for my poached pears, I like to use Anjou pears, because uh, they've got a nice pear flavor. Uh, they have some substance to them, so they won't, they won't fall apart on us. Um, a little trick. Whenever I'm peeling a lot of things, I'll generally, like today, I took a big sheet of parchment paper and laid it down so that I don't have to worry about where my peels are going. And this way I can just bundle up my paper towels at the end of the peeling process, unless you're, you know, over the sink. Oftentimes when I'm peeling, I'm far away from a sink, so I just make my little catch-all. And I'll take it right down I like to get rid of, of everything except for this little bottom core and the stem on the top. We do want to leave the stem on because the stem is going to keep it somewhat intact for us. So we don't want to remove the stem. We just want to get as much of the peel away. Into our water, into our poaching liquid. Now normally, I don't want to add too much water, I probably, in a perfect scenario I'd add, add more port but as I said if we had more pears in there it would rise our level oftentimes pears like to float to the top so what I'll do is I'll just grab a plate actually normally if I have here so we're just gonna pretend for a moment poaching a pear took about approximately 25 minutes okay it is a long time, yes. I, t I, didn't t I didn't say it would be easy. All right. <laughs> did I? I don't think I did say it would be easy. So, 25 minutes till we're nice and soft. Uh, I normally scoop them out of the poaching liquid, set them on a sheet pan, and let them cool down to room temperature. Uh, and then I will refrigerate them let them get nice and cold before I pull them out and start the preparation process. So what we're going to do is we're going to cut her in half. Sometimes if you grab the, the stem just right, you can get a fair amount of the center out. And then I will go back with a little melon baller to get the final little bit out. And then always check to make sure that we've got the, our bottom out of here. Other side, same thing, little scoop. Sometimes if I can't get a hold of this, I'll just go in with my paring knife, gently remove it. So then for presentation, what I like to do, and I find the easiest thing to do is, you can fan it on the cutting board and try and move it. I find it easier to put it on the plate that I'm serving it on, and then making my fan cuts. So I'm just making thin cuts. almost like uh, dealing a deck of cards. Uh, we're serving this with a little bit of vanilla ice cream, some whipped cream, and one thing I do is, when I finish poaching, what I like to do is strain everything out of this poaching liquid, add sugar to it, and reduce it by about half. So we really concentrate, and this is about even uh, a little bit less. Let's see what we see what we get. That's why we chefs love gas stoves because we can really affect change very quickly. This is more the action I'm looking for with my poaching. You can see steam just barely barely floating and just the tiniest little bit of agitation in the bottom. So that's poached port poached pears. All right, once again, sweet and simple, six ingredients. All right, so uh, just keep it simple. 
is probably the, the best advice I can give to you. Keep it simple and practice is what it really is. It's, you know, not only using simple ingredients, but knowing how to treat said ingredients. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome, ma'am. I'm glad you enjoyed it, and thank you. It's my pleasure.